Physics, chemistry, physiology, or medicine, literature, peace, these are the five categories which make up the Nobel Prizes. Established in 1895 by Swedish industrialist and inventor of dynamite Alfred Nobel, the prizes seek to honor the individuals and organizations who have made the greatest contributions to humankind. Since the first award ceremony was held in 1901, the Nobel Prize, along with related Swedish Central Bank Prize in Economic Sciences, aka the Nobel Prize in Economics, has been awarded 609 times to 975 people and 25 organizations from 84 different countries and territories. In terms of sheer numbers of Nobel laureates, Four of these lead the pack by a wide margin. The United States with 420, the UK with 142, Germany with 115, and France with 75. However, all of these nations have relatively large populations. Which region then has the greatest number of Nobel laureates per capita? The answer, unexpectedly, is the Faroe Islands. Located in the North Atlantic, halfway between the Shetland Islands and Iceland, this rugged archipelago of 18 islands has been an autonomous territory of the Kingdom of Denmark since 1814. As of this recording, the Faroes boast a whopping 18.18 Nobel laureates per million residents, ahead of St. Lucia with 10.81 per million, Luxembourg with 3.5, and Switzerland with 3.1. But given that the Faroes only have a population of just under 55,000, in terms of sheer numbers of laureates, this translates to, well, one. That person is Niels Finsen, awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1903 for his development of phototherapy, which brought relief to thousands of sufferers of various skin diseases. This is his remarkable forgotten story. Niels Ryberg Finsen was born on December 15, 1860, in the Faroese capital of Torshavn, the second of four children born to Iceland are Hans Finsen and his Danish wife, Johanna Forman. The elder Finsen moved to the Faroes two years before to serve as the island's Langfogård, an administrative position roughly equivalent to sheriff. He was later elected as Amtmann, or prefect of the Faroes, serving in this capacity for 12 years. Indeed, civil service became something of a family tradition, with Niels's older brother Olaf also serving in the Faroese parliament for five years and even becoming the first mayor of Torshavn. Johanna died in 1864 when Niels was only four years old, whereupon Hannes remarried to Johanna's cousin, Brigitte Foreman. The couple would go on to have a further six children together. For all of his later accomplishments, Niels Finsen was not a strong student and struggled to learn modern Danish. The principal of his first boarding school in Her Lufsholm, Denmark, called him a boy of good heart but low skills and energy. In 1876, he was sent to Lerøyskolen, his father's old school in Reykjavik, Iceland, from which he finally graduated in 1881 at the age of 21. Yet, despite these early struggles, Finsen decided to pursue medicine and enrolled at the University of Copenhagen. During his studies, he had the good fortune of staying in the prestigious Ragnarsson dormitory, to which Icelanders and Faroese Icelanders were given priority admission as a matter of Danish government policy. Finson graduated with a doctorate in medicine in 1890 and took up a position as a protector of anatomy, preparing dissection specimens for other medical students. Two years later, he married Ingeborg Balslev. The couple had four children together, three of whom survived to adulthood. His son, Haldor, born in 1896, later became a physician like his father, while his daughter, Gerdren, born in 1900, married Professor S. Lomholt, who served as head of Finson's own Department of Skin Diseases and later wrote his father-in-law's official biography. Finson worked as a prosector for three years before quitting to devote himself full-time to scientific research, privately tutoring students to support his family. The research in question was of particular importance to Finson, being largely inspired by his own health problems. In his early 20s, Finson began suffering from chronic pain, fatigue, abdominal swelling, or ascites and anemia symptoms, which gradually worsened and saw him confined to a wheelchair in the latter years of his life. Only after his death was it determined that Finson was suffering from a rare congenital disorder known as Neiman Pick disease. First described in the 1910s and 20s by German pediatricians Albert Neiman and Ludwig Pick, Neiman Pick disease results from problems with lipid transport within cells. Normally, lipids are temporarily stored in a cell's lysosomes, small bag like organelles, to be broken down by enzymes, whereupon the decomposed products are transported out of the cell. In sufferers of Neiman Pick disease, however, this transport is impaired, causing lipids to accumulate in the cells of various tissues, including the brain, nerves, liver, spleen, and bone marrow, and progressively damage them. Today, there are three known types of Neiman Pick disease, A, B, and C. Type A is caused by a mutation in the SPD1 gene, which impedes the action of the enzyme sphingomyelinase and causes a buildup of the lipid sphingomyelin. 
Symptoms manifest in infancy and can include severe liver, nerve, and brain damage. A few sufferers live more than a few years. Type B, also known as juvenile onset Neiman Pick disease, develops later and is less severe, sparing the brain but causing progressive damage to the nerves, liver, spleen, and lungs. Finally, type C is a genetically distant variant caused by mutations to the MBC1 and MBC2 genes, which code for the proteins needed to transport cholesterol in and out of cells. Without these proteins, cholesterol builds up inside cells, causing progressive damage. Symptoms vary widely and can appear at any age. Even today, there is no known treatment for Neiman Pick disease, aside from the management of symptoms. Not knowing this, however, Niels Finsen sought relief however he could, leading him down an unexpected path of medical discoveries. He later recalled, My disease has played a very great role for my whole development. The disease was responsible for my starting investigations on light. I suffered from anemia and tiredness, and since I lived in a house facing the north, I began to believe that I might be helped if I received more sun. I therefore spent as much time as possible in its rays. As an enthusiastic medical man, I was of course interested to know what benefit the sun really gave. I considered it from the physiological point of view, but got no answer. I drew the conclusion that I was right and the physiology wrong. From this time, I collected all possible observations about animals seeking the sun, and my conviction that the sun had a useful and important effect on the organism became stronger and stronger. What this useful effect really was, I could not find. I've been working for this goal ever since, but have not been able to find exactly what I have been seeking, though we have gone somewhat forward. The use of sunlight as a curative agent has a long history in traditional medicine. By the time Vincent began his research, several physicians and scientists had begun to study the medicinal properties of light more rigorously. For example, in 1887, British biologists Arthur Downs and Thomas Bunt discovered that open containers of sugar water placed on a windowsill turned cloudy in the shade, but remained clear in direct sunlight. They deduced from this that sunlight, or at least some component of it, was capable of killing bacteria. In 1865, Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell published the groundbreaking paper A Dynamical Theory of the Electromagnetic Field, which revealed, among many other things, that light is an electromagnetic wave whose color depends on its wavelength. Scientists soon discovered that ordinary sunlight contains not only a visible component ranging from red at 400 nanometers to violet at 700 nanometers, but also invisible components of both longer and shorter wavelengths what at the time were known as chemical rays or ionizing light, but today as infrared and ultraviolet light. And to learn more about the strangely arbitrary way the classic rainbow we know and love came about, please do check out our previous video, Why Does the Rainbow Have Seven Colors? and The Weird Reason Indigo Is In It. Downs and Bunt's research revealed that the ultraviolet end of the spectrum had the greatest antibacterial effect. While other scientists and physicians had seized upon this discovery and attempted to treat various skin diseases with both natural and and artificial light, Finzen was unsatisfied with these attempts. Either the application of light was far too brief to have any therapeutic effect, or so intense that the other components of the light inflicted additional damage to the patient's skin. Finson thus set about developing a special lamp which would emit only therapeutically useful wavelengths. Known appropriately as the Finson lamp, this device produced light by striking a powerful electric arc between a pair of carbon electrodes and used a fused quartz lens to filter out all but the desired ultraviolet rays. Initially, Finson experimented on standard laboratory bacteria such as Micrococcus prodigiosus as well as various strains of typhoid and anthrax. And to learn more about the dark history of anthrax as a biological weapon, please do check out the video. Canada's plan to unleash a bacteriological apocalypse on our sister channel, Highlight History. Finson also tested the lamp on his own body, measuring how deeply certain wavelengths penetrated into the skin and the maximum radiation intensity that could be applied without inflicting unwanted burns. In the process, he discovered that light absorption was severely impaired by the presence of blood, and thus developed various devices to apply pressure and to push blood out of the areas of the body being irradiated. Finson soon moved on to clinical trials, focusing initially on the disfiguring pustules caused by the dreaded disease smallpox. Initially, experiments revealed that ultraviolet radiation actually aggravated these pustules, so Finson built a new lamp that filtered out ultraviolet and emitted mainly infrared light. These results were promising, with infrared phototherapy greatly speeding the healing of smallpox lesions and reducing the severity of the resulting scars. In 1895, Vincent began a partnership with the Copenhagen Electric Lightworks, setting up shop in their research laboratory. As luck would have it, one of the company's engineers, Niels Morgensen, suffered from lupus vulgaris, a painful and often disfiguring skin condition caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which more infamously infects the lungs and bones. Morgensen had tried various treatments, including medication and surgery, but to no avail. After only four days of treatment with an ultraviolet Finson lamp, his condition dramatically improved. 
Spurred on by these promising results, that same year, Vincent expanded his research to study a group of 11 patients who had been suffering from Lucas vulgaris for between 5 and 21 years. For two weeks, Vincent applied concentrated ultraviolet light to the patient's lesions for two hours each day and once again observed dramatic improvements in their condition. While Vincent himself admitted that 11 patients was not a large sample size, he noted that as the treatment was extremely local, its effects could be noted on multiple areas on each patient. His findings were published in a pair of groundbreaking papers on effects of light on the skin, published in 1893, and the use of concentrated chemical light rays in medicine, published in 1896. As many sufferers of lupus vulgaris were poor and struggled to find gainful employment due to their disfigured appearance, in 1896, Finzen established the Medical Light Institute in Copenhagen to administer his treatment for free. It was funded from wealthy patrons and the mayor of Copenhagen. The institute quickly grew, and at its peak, it employed a staff of eight doctors, 53 nurses, and three assistants. By 1901, Finson had treated a total of 804 patients, of which a whopping 83% were completely cured of their condition, while only 6% failed to show any improvement. That same year, the organization's name was changed to the Finson Institute. Prototherapy soon began to catch on outside of Denmark. Within a few years, no fewer than 40 Finson Institutes were established across Europe and the United States, bringing relief to thousands of sufferers of lupus vulgaris, smallpox, and other conditions. Meanwhile, one of Finson's most enthusiastic disciples, Swiss physician August Rolia, established a chain of sanatoriums in the Alps for sufferers of both pulmonary tuberculosis and lupus vulgaris. Not only was the cool, clean mountain air thought to be beneficial for patients' lungs, but at high altitudes, the atmosphere filters out less ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Hundreds of patients were thus laid out on cots outdoors so that they could soak up the sun's heating rays. Such establishments remained popular until the 1950s, when the development of the antibiotic streptomycin finally gave doctors a direct means of treating tuberculosis. Finson's belief in the power of phototherapy was vindicated on October 17, 1903, when he received a letter from Stockholm informing him that he'd been awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, quote, in recognition of his contribution to the treatment of diseases, especially lupus vulgaris, with concentrated light radiation, whereby he has opened a new avenue for medical science. He was the first Scandinavian, and as of this recording, the only Faroe Islander to be honored. Allegedly, Finson's reaction to the letter was to declare, well, thus it has now been established that the thing is Danish. A reference to the fact that several other doctors had previously laid claim to the invention of phototherapy. But the controversy regarding Finson's Nobel Prize didn't end there, with opponents claiming that his research had too little theoretical basis to be worthy of such a lofty scientific honor. The Nobel Committee, however, emphasized the contribution of Finson's work to the well-being of all mankind, which aligned perfectly with the original intentions of Alfred Nobel when establishing the prizes. Sadly, Finson was unable to attend the actual prize ceremony on December 10, 1903, on account of his steadily declining health, instead spending the day at home receiving congratulations from friends and colleagues. By this time, the effects of Neiman Pick disease had gotten so severe that Finson was confined to a wheelchair and had to have the ascites or fluid buildup in his abdomen drained as many as 18 times a day. Nonetheless, he sent a note of acceptance to the Nobel Committee stating that the supreme qualities of all science and honesty, reliability, and sober, healthy criticism. He also chose to donate 50,000 Danish kroner of his prize money to the Finson Institute and another 60,000 to a sanatorium for heart and liver disease, which he had also founded. This in turn prompted the Finson Institute's two greatest donors to contribute a further 50,000 kroner each. Finson also received numerous other awards and honors for his work. In 1898, he was granted a full professorship at the University of Copenhagen, while in 1899, he was made a Knight of the Order of Danabrog. And in 1905, shortly after receiving his Nobel Prize, he was awarded the Cameron Prize for Therapeutics by the University of Edinburgh. All the while, Finson continued to seek out effective treatments for his condition. He soon focused his attention on the role of salt intake, theorizing that high salt concentrations were at least partially responsible for his ascites. Using himself as a guinea pig, he thus adopted a low-sodium diet, carefully noted each glass of water he drank, measured the salt content of his urine, and took various diuretics to help expel salt from his body. This research resulted in one of his final scientific papers, An Accumulation of Salt in the Organism, published in 1904. Unfortunately, none of these efforts succeeded in ameliorating Finson's condition, and he finally died on September 24th, 1904, at the age of only 44. He was given a royal funeral in recognition of his achievements and buried in Copenhagen's Western Cemetery. Finson's work inspired research into a whole range of phototherapies for various diseases, perhaps the most extreme of which was ultraviolet blood irradiation, developed in the late 1920s by American medical researchers Dr. Emmett Knott and Lester Edblom. This involved extracting a patient's blood, exposing it to powerful ultraviolet radiation, and returning it in order to treat severe infections such as streptococcal sepsis, peritonitis, poliomyelitis, 
some botulism and to learn more about the latter disease and its surprising contribution to the cosmetics industry please do check out our previous video the surprisingly fascinating story of one of medicine's deadliest but most versatile pharmaceuticals but whilst our treatments showed a great deal of promise the development of effective antibiotics vaccines and other drugs largely eclipsed phototherapy in the treatment of lupus vulgaris smallpox and other infections however related therapies are still widely used for the treatment of other skin conditions including acne eczema psoriasis vitiligo neonatal jaundice and vitamin d deficiency various wavelengths of light from near infrared to long wave uva and short wave uvb with the mechanism of action being slightly different in each case for example neonatal jaundice results from the buildup of a yellowish orange compound called bilirubin in the baby's body and is treated with a special blue billy light with a wavelength of 420 to 470 nanometers this converts bilirubin from its fat soluble trans isomer to its water soluble cis isomer allowing it to be eliminated in the baby's urine and stool by contrast psoriasis and autoimmune immune disorder is treated using shortwave UVB radiation which suppresses the immune system helps reduce inflammation UVB is also used in the treatment of vitamin D deficiency stimulating the breakdown of 7-dehydrocholesterol in the skin into cholecalpherol aka vitamin D3 industrially cocosiferol was originally synthesized by exposing pig skin to UVB radiation and extracting the resulting vitamin though this has since been replaced by 7-dehydrocholesterol derived from linoleum extracted from sheep's wool Finally, longer wave UVA radiation is used in the treatment of vitiligo, another autoimmune disorder characterized by the formation of unpigmented patches on the patient's skin. And yes, that's the same condition that Michael Jackson suffered from. UVA radiation stimulates the skin to produce more of the pigment melanin, evening out the discoloration. Indeed, this ability to stimulate melanin production is the reason tanning beds are designed to produce mainly UVA radiation. But while the specific treatments developed by Niels Finsen are now largely obsolete, this does not take away from his achievements, which brought relief to thousands of sufferers worldwide and helped pioneer a promising new field of medicine. And in any case, Finsen was far from the only researcher to be awarded a Nobel Prize for developing a medical treatment that later turned out to be a sometimes horrific scientific dead end. And to learn more about two such examples, please do check out our previous videos. That time a dude was given a Nobel Prize for intentionally infecting people with malaria and a crisis of minds, the fascinating tale of healing people by destroying their brains. Thanks for watching.